in May three years ago, and mostly what we're doing is based on what Germany has done over the last six or seven years, and they base most of theirs on canola, and they rank canola oil as being the best to use as an engine fuel, then sunflower oil, and then soybean oil, they say, don't use it all. How much of that is fact and how much of that is their bias against such soybeans in general, I don't know. Um, canola has always been a, a favorite crop over there anyway. But, so we based ours on, their, on what they had done. So we grow canola here, we combine it, store it, dry it a little bit, store it, and then press it for oil for those two tractors. So that's the primary reason farm operations got into growing canola and pressing canola, is for those two tractors in cooperation with New Holland, who provided it's 180 horsepower, PTO horsepower farm tractor and then a front end loader that also is modified to run on, on vegetable oil. Both machines were modified by Elsbeth, the German company, with systems that they make, and they were modified down at the New Holland plant down in New Holland, Pennsylvania. So Elsbeth did the modifications and then the tractors came up here. In the years that they've been running, the first six months or so, they actually bought oil from Housing and Food Services because they weren't pressing their own oil yet. So it's kind of odd to think about the oil that comes in to go into the fryers on campus and gets diverted and goes into the tractors over here. But that was real expensive though. They had the oil out, they had the press, so we started pressing oil about two years ago now. And we pressed over 4,000 gallons now of canola oil. So 4,000 gallons have gone through those two tractors and it's still going through them. Over the spring they haven't used much at all. Um, but hopefully things will straighten out and get going again. This press is a Kerncraft press. Kerncraft is a German company. Their press is made in Sweden. Um, Germany has a few manufacturers. There's some that come out of China, some out of India, and some out of Sweden, all the major places that the presses come from. But inside, this is a twin expeller press, so there are two screws. There's a screw inside of here. It basically takes the canola seed. This is canola seed, and each seed's about 40% oil. And that's where Canola is one of, one of the reasons why canola is grown or favored for an oilseed crop. It's pretty high in canola. Um, per acre, we get about 40 bushels to the acre, somewhere in there. You can do more, you can do less. And each bushel we get, the last time we measured here was 2.1 gallons of clean oil out of each bushel of canola. You'll see numbers higher than that, and you'll see numbers lower than that. That's what we've been getting when we go through a whole bin of, of canola. That's what we measured at. So, um, with this press, we run it at a speed that we get about 50 gallons in a 24 hour period. You can run it faster, but then you get more what's called hooks in the oil. Um, you see there's, there's stuff that comes through. Some of these are weed seeds that float on top. Some are hulls. And a lot of it settles, most of it settles to the bottom, but some floats on top. So even though we're getting 50 gallon drum of oil in a day, that doesn't mean we're getting 50 gallons of, of filtered oil. Mm -hmm. Roughly, I let it sit for a while, like this one's been sitting for a few weeks. These are all the foots that come to the bottom, and it's about almost 8%. And it seems to vary by variety. This Wichita seems to be higher. We seem to get more foots than we did with the other ones. But the, um, I think we run through about a bushel an hour. I think that's about what it comes out to. Uh, After it gets pressed here, the meal then, the meal is, is fairly warm when it comes out. That's one reason this is a fan that sits on top of this. And it's a little bit gummy when it comes out of here. And then after it, it, after it cools, it, it solidifies pretty well and gets, gets pretty hard. And so the meal is about 34% protein. Soybean meal is up in the 40%, 42, 48% protein range. So it's not as high as soybean meal protein wise, but it's very close and it's much better than something like sunflower meal, sunflower seed meal. But the meal right now, there's a guy 
in Center County who does nutrition work with some small dairy herds. Right now he's purchasing it and taking it down and, and just using it with the rations for those dairy herds. We have sent some over to the beef farms at one time. Uh, one of the problems with this whole setup is we're making oil based on the usage of the tractors. That means we don't have a consistent supply of meal every week. We don't have four tons of meal every week coming out of here. And so this guy who's, who we're working with, he's happy with that. The price is reasonable for, it, it competes, well, it's less expensive than soybean meal for the guys he's working with. And he mixes some soybean meal and some canola meal. And it, it gives us an outlet for the meal. Some of the other uses for meal, um, it can be used as a organic, certified organic uh, fertilizer. It's about 111 is its capability for that. And Heather Darby has done some work with using it as a fertilizer to see where it goes, how fast it goes, and all that sort of stuff. Um, one other use for it that probably isn't the best use is they look a lot like wood pellets. They will work as a mix for wood stove. They actually have, because they have residual oil in them, they actually have more BTUs per pound than wood pellets do. They make more ash, they have a lot of nitrogen in them, so probably the emissions aren't that good. But that's a, we have tried just burning them on a grate here. And if you just light them, and take a torch away, they don't keep, they won't keep burning. But as long as you keep the torch on them, then they'll burn and they heat. So once they had an air induction underneath them and they were burning with some wood pellets, they'd work. I'd always heard about filter presses, didn't have any experience with them, and that's what this beast is right here. And it, um, it's used a lot, it's used in a lot of different places. This is a very, very small filter press. This one was built for more or less of a lab scale type thing. The Ag Engineering Department had it over here, and they got it for a project with apple juice, and they put it in salvage, and I just happened to see it that day. And so I buckled on to it because these are also pretty darn expensive. The ones that would be typically sized with this size press, the plates would be more like about this wide and about that tall. And I, I can filter out. We don't settle everything out first. We can only filter about 100 gallons before this fills up with all the foots and you have to clean it out. But it's neat because it's reusable. Um, and it does very very good job that that gallon you guys had of oil was filtered through this and it doesn't leave any sediment that you can see or test for behind i haven't cleaned it out since i last ran it so and it's not running as great as it should but this is what's inside of there and it's basically it's uh almost like a kevlar cloth on the bottom that things can go through and then on the top of that I'll show you better with this one this is, a really, this is the way I ought to come out but you can see there's a white coating on here and that white coating is diatomaceous earth and diatomaceous earth if any of you have ever had a swimming pool that you have a filter on a lot of times they use diatomaceous earth in those or it's also used for filtering apple juice or beer or all kinds of food products and it's just ground up diatoms little guys lived a long time ago but that diatomaceous earth that white powder we mix with clean oil we pump through this initially after we clean all these filter cloths off pump it through real fast and it coats the inside of this cloth that's what this stuff is right here with that diatomaceous earth then that really becomes the filter media if you try just using this cloth in about 10 30 seconds it just plugs up with all these fine pieces here, all this fine stuff, it just plugs up with that and nothing will pass through it anymore. We found that out. <laughs> As everybody probably tries without anything. So then, found out about filter, filtering aids, use that, and it, and pretty well, this one's pretty well packed full. And if you just keep it running through, gradually increasing the pressure, there's an air operated diaphragm pump on the end there. And so we just pump out of the drum, pump into this, and you start out at maybe 20 psi against this and the oil flows through and then after a while it slows down and then you raise the pressure to 40 and then to 60 and then to 80 and finally 100 until nothing will pass through anymore and then it's pretty well filled up like this um, one of the other things we do is we have drum heaters these bands right here 
wrap those around the 55 gallon drums and heat the oil up to usually about 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 120 degrees Fahrenheit. If it's just 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it just takes a lot longer to go through and you'll spend all day trying to get through a couple drums where if you heat it, it'll run through in a few hours. When we were doing the the pressing of oil for the for the tractors, that was the major reason we got into pressing canola oil. But then as time went on and, and you start thinking about taking the oil that you're pressing as being something that's used for food or can be used for food and dumping it into an engine tank, that's the food versus fuel thing, you know, right up front. So canola oil also can be used as food. So I started wondering about the value of this oil that we were dumping into tank at about diesel fuel was about three dollars a gallon at the time and the university is buying 25,000 gallons a year of canola oil to use in the fryers on campus and it's basically the same stuff. The difference being that the canola oil used in fryers is bleached and, and refined a little better, deodorized. And they pay the contract changes but somewhere around seven dollars a gallon for, for that oil. So we got looking at that price differential and thinking if we could use it first in the fryers and then bring it back, run it through the biodiesel process, transesterification, make it into biodiesel, and use that as fuel for the tractor that grows the canola and makes that round trip again, then that probably would be a better way of, of using the oil because then you're using it for food and you're using it for fuel. Um, for human and cats. Yeah. Yep. Meal. So you have the... Um, you have that whole cycle going around. The university purchases oil. Obviously not oil, all the oil they purchase comes back as used oil. We've been collecting the used oil now for a little over a year and it, it's, nobody really knew how much used oil came out of the university. A contractor picked it up and took it away and nobody ever really knew how much there was. Looks like there's about 12,000 gallons a year of used vegetable oil that comes out of the university. Now, interestingly too, that has a value. Um, for years, you know, this biodiesel thing that you hear about, a lot of times people like to say it's a good use for waste vegetable oil. Well, waste vegetable oil was around before biodiesel was around. So waste vegetable oil had a use and it went into animal feeds. Um, and it goes into other processes as well. So it's not something that just, biodiesel is just another market now for that. So the used vegetable oil does have a, have a a price does have a value and that, that value is like a commodity. It's traded on the Chicago Board of Trade just like other futures are and it goes up and down and it varies. But if we start looking at the university it seems like a perfect opportunity to try to encapsulate a cycle of being able to grow the canola, press the canola for oil, make the canola food grade so it can go into the dining halls, come back from the dining hall, um, is used vegetable oil, go through a biodiesel process and go into the vehicles that grow the canola and also other vehicles, diesel vehicles on campus. So all of the production, you're not hauling canola from Canada to here, you're not hauling the meal from Canada to Midwest where it goes into a livestock operation. You're not spending all that extra carbon moving things from one place to another. It's all staying in the, in the same area. And it would give us a real good opportunity to get a better handle on the costs involved in the whole in the whole process. So in a nutshell, that's that's what we're still interested in doing. I don't know if we'll ever provide all the oil for the university, but it would be pretty neat to be able to provide some of that and have student input into the whole thing and give students a whole broad picture of the energy side of it and the food processing side of it and the meal side of it and come up with other uses for meal and, and start looking at some of those things.